You know, it is not every day that a former president of the United States is in a courthouse, much less as a defendant in a case that threatens to bring down the entire brand that he used to propel himself into office in the first place. Today, Donald Trump was back in court in the $250 million civil fraud trial in New York. Both before walking in and during a break, Trump lashed out, as he so often has, at the judge at the trial, at the New York attorney general who brought the lawsuit. It was his usual list of grievances, so we are not going to play them for you here. But he did not mention Judge Ngoron's clerk, who has been a frequent target of his, recognizing that he remains under a gag order that prohibits him from talking about court staff. Inside the courtroom, accounting expert Eli Bartov took the stand. He testified that in his expert opinion, the attorney general's claims of a years-long pattern of fraud of manipulating the values of Trump's real estate assets were baseless. Quote, there is no evidence whatsoever for any accounting fraud, he said. Donald Trump was reportedly visibly pleased, but there were moments of tension. ABC News reports as accounting expert Eli Bartov was testifying about Trump's use of disclaimers in his financial statements. State attorney Kevin Wallace interjected, saying, this is pure speculation from someone they hired to say whatever it is they want. Still in the witness box, Bartov began yelling at Wallace about the comment as Trump sat watching just a few feet away. You make up allegations that never existed, Bartov shouted. I am here to tell the truth. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for talking like that. Bartov is the second to last witness to testify for the defense. The last witness? Donald Trump himself. He's expected to take the stand on Monday in his own defense in what could turn into another dramatic day in court. Here's how NBC News describes the last time he went on the stand. Trump's testimony last month quickly went off the rails as he hurled attacks against the judge and lawyers in the case, whom he decried as unfair, dodged questions, and repeatedly went on tangents. Trump also got into heated exchanges with Judge Arthur and Goron from the stand after the judge exorciated him for giving unresponsive answers. And Goron called on Trump's lawyers to control him and warned that this isn't a political rally. And that is where we start today with Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times investigative reporter Russ Butner, former top official with the Justice Department and MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman, an editor-at-large for The Bulwark, Charlie Sykes. Russ, walk us through what it is we saw today in court. Well, I think it's um, it, 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 this really is their star witness. It's the first witness that the Trump defense has put up that tried to poke any substantial holes, I think, in the massive trove of documents that uh, sort of prove out this case. This witness wasn't a surprise to the judge, certainly. He filed two lengthy affidavits in, uh, in this case uh, earlier this year. He was deposed by the attorney general. That was all part of a court record before the judge ruled that the Trump's had committed fraud that the AG approved that part of their case. And the substance of what he said today and what he said in those affidavits is that um, basically that they're taking the sort of the wrong approach. The attorney general is holding him to a standard of following generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, Professor Bartov says that's not necessary for these sort of uh, financial statements. The uh, attorney general uh, has taken issue with the fact that they withheld appraisals uh, that they had that showed the properties they had were of lower value than what they represented on their form. Professor Bartov says appraisals aren't required to be a part of these sort of things, so the fact that they withheld them does not represent fraud. Uh, he also, I think, notably said that in cases where Donald Trump valued properties as if he had unbridled use to use them for anything he wanted to, when in fact he had great restrictions on them, that that wasn't a fraud to withhold that, that he was entitled to take uh, in Professor Bartov's words, the long view, and assume that he could get laws changed, for example, for rent-regulated apartments, that he could get variances to build as many uh, houses as he wanted in Aberdeen, and that that was all okay. So I think that's sort of why Donald Trump is so excited about this, is he, he, this expert tries to poke holes in the entire case. But again, I think it's important to remember the judge, certainly the fact finder in this case, has already seen all this material, and that was part of the decision he issued against the Trumps back in September. I, I wonder, this exchange, Andrew, um, from the state attorney, Kevin Wallace, saying this is pure speculation from someone they hired to say whatever it is they want. What, what does an expert, what, an expert witness like this, like Bartov, what is the purpose? What is supposed to bring the defense? 
Well, I have to say the reports um, of the sort of back and forth between uh, the state's attorney and the expert witness is not the model for what you expect in court, either from <laughs> lawyers or from the expert witness. Um, you know, th those sort of side comments and sniping really should not be occurring. Um, so this is sort of not the high road. Um, but um, that is really up to the state that has the burden here to either undermine the testimony and to bring out facts, um, or to they will have a rebuttal case and they can put on additional evidence. I have to say I'm quite skeptical of the testimony from the expert about the long view, where it would include um, going against stated, documented uh, things that Donald Trump had committed to in the deeds and the agreements to say, I'm just assuming all of that isn't true without revealing all of that to uh, the banks as to um, how he got to that appraisal figure. It also isn't totally appropriate for an expert to testify about whether there is or is not fraud, what is in the head of the people who prepared these, as opposed to giving expert testimony about what the rules are in his view. Um, so this was sort of an interesting day. It'll be interesting, I think, mostly to see what, if anything, the state does to, um, to counter this evidence in their rebuttal case, because they will have a chance to put on additional evidence when Donald Trump finishes his testimony on Monday. Russ, there, there was a lot that was made uh, of disclaimers attached to Trump's financial statements. According to ABC News, quote, Bartov in his testimony said that Trump's use of disclaimers functioned just like the warning from the Surgeon General on a box of cigarettes. The accounting expert said that Trump's disclaimers clearly flagged to his lenders that they should conduct their own due diligence regarding the figures rather than rely on them at face value. So to make sure that I am understanding the argument here is the banks were warned. It's their fault they were defrauded. That does seem to be the point. I think that's exactly right, Elisa. And it's a strange point to get to, because the issue here is um, not that there was not, as Donald Trump's called it over and over again, a worthlessness statement um, that he says makes this document so it's sort of a red flag that this document is entirely worthless. That's not the issue. The issue at hand here, I think, is that they withheld so much information from their lenders. This case really comes down to two numbers. How much he, what was his net worth and how much cash did he have on hand? And he, he asserted to certain levels of that when he got these loans at very favorable rates, basically saying, I don't need this money. And then every year he had to reassert that. And you see in the documents of this case and the under sort of the underpinnings of it, that as his over the years, as his money from uh, entertainment, from The Apprentice and from celebrity licensing deals dropped off, his businesses went cash flow negative. And every year they had to find new ways to sort of patch that hole to reach that threshold. And he's withholding stuff uh, from his lenders and fr in the, from his accountants in the creation of these documents. And that's the issue of it, is, is not being forthcoming with all the things that would lower the value. And there's one example, I think, that is phenomenal, where they claimed that they had access to a cash, to all the cash in a business in which he had a passive investment. And that patched up that one number, how much cash he had on hand. But he didn't. To know that, you'd have to have the partnership agreement. Professor Bartov says in his affidavit that, well, Deutsche Bank could have gone and got the partnership agreement and reviewed it and decided that, 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 that themselves. I don't know at what point you get beyond due diligence, being careful as a lender, to where you're actually conducting a full-fledged investigation with almost subpoena power to figure out where your customer might be misleading you. I think I mean, that's the sort of nub of this thing. Right. And Andrew, speak to that point and the argument that we might yep. hear fr from prosecutors in that regard. Absolutely. I think this is where it's important to know what the law is. Um, the law in New York with respect to the causes of action that are on trial, which is causes of action two through seven. Um, remember, cause of action one, there's already been liability. What differentiates the first cause of action from all these others? The first cause of action, you do not need to show intent and you do not need to show reliance or materiality. 
Um, and so it was easier for there to be summary judgment, and that's already been decided by the judge. For these counts, it is not necessary for the state to prove reliance by Deutsche Bank um, or an insurer or any mm -hmm. bank. That is not part of the crime. Um, and so there was a lot of back and forth about that issue, um, but that's not something that is necessary. Um, it is necessary for um, the representations to be false, for them to be knowingly false, and for there to be um, something material. In other words, it can't be something like, what's your favorite color? And you said, you know, it's blue, and it turns out it's green. Mm -hmm. No one cares about that. But these are the thing, kinds of things that are material, and the burden is not on the bank to have to, as Russ said, to do sort of a forensic examination to find out if you're being lied to. They're entitled to rely on written statements. And a really good argument for that is why else require that you fill these out and give them to a bank? I mean, we all do that when we seek a loan from a bank. We know that this is material that needs to be truthful and that a bank is entitled to rely on. The fact that the bank could have figured out that these were, um, in fact, not accurate is not really um, a burden that they have. And so I think you're going to hear a lot of arguments about that when this sums up uh, from both sides.